be Puritan. It's a virtue to be pure. Uh, and what really counts, what's really important, is what happens in another world after this one. And what will really happen is this kind of actions. OK, so to conclude then, um, section 16. Um, these two systems of valuation, the, what he's calling the noble system and the moral system, have been in a struggle for thousands of years. He symbolizes this struggle, he says, between, um, uh, as a struggle between Rome and Judea. Uh, Judea, you should be thinking here of Christianity. Um, and he thinks that this struggle between noble values and moral values has not entirely been resolved. Um, but it's clear that the moral values of self-denial and has the upper hand in things for a long time. Um, I want to remind you still, it's important to remember that what we call a system of values is complicated thing with different strands from different um, historical periods mixed together in a maybe more, maybe less coherent system. Um, it's a complicated and contradictory business. And remember that um, in Beyond Good and Evil, he says that uh, in any actual society, you're going to have a mix of different systems. And indeed, in any individual person, you're going to have a mix of different systems. Okay, so 31. Um, uh, top of the page, he says, Rome sensed in the Jew, something in the morals and the values, something like anti-nature itself. It's antipodal monstrosity, as it were, uh, in the moral system and values. Down the middle of the page. The Romans were, after all, um, the strong and noble ones, such that none stronger and nobler have ever existed, ever even been dreamt of. Everything that remains of them, every inscription thrills, supposing that one can guess what is, do, what is doing the writing there. The Jews, Christians, conversely, were the priestly people of resentment par excellence, in whom there dwelt a popular moral genius without parallel. Um, so, which of them, section 20, uh, sorry, line 26, which of them has been victorious in the meantime, Rome or Judea? There's no doubt at all. Just consider before whom, bow, whom one bows today in Rome itself as before the quintessence of all the highest values, and the Pope. Um, so there's no doubt that morality has come to dominate um, in modern European life. Um, and not only in Rome, but over almost half the earth, everywhere that man has become tame, or wants to become tame. That's what Christian morality is all about. Teaming people and disciplining them. Uh, teaching them to hate their physical embodied existence, to hate those who revel in their physical embodied existence, identify them as evil, and imagine that what really counts is life in another world, in heaven, after we escape from. Body. Okay, so there were two partial exceptions to this triumph of Christian morality that he talks about. Um, the first one is on pages 31 to 32. The first was the Renaissance, which was the reawakening of a kind of classical ideal. Um, he thinks that this was a flicker of uh, non-aestheticism, a flicker of um, G 
genuine affirmation contrary to uh, moral values. But it was crushed by, he thinks, the Reformation. So the Reformation was a reassertion of resentment, a reassertion of asceticism and hatred toward uh, worldly existence. Um, and second example that he mentions here was the French Revolution, and especially under Napoleon. Um, but this was, he thinks, too late even for Napoleon that he was unable to succeed in creating a noble system of values. Okay, so I want to say one more thing about this, and that is that Nietzsche's uh, invocation of Napoleon here, the French Revolution, and his sometimes militaristic images here um, has given him a sort of reputation of admiring um, militaristic um, heroes or militaristic rulers. Here is one place where there's a kind of allusion to Napoleon, and he's expressing a kind of admiration here. But this is a rather rare example in Nietzsche's work. Somebody actually went through um, his works to see which kinds of individuals he expresses admiration for, um, which are sort of his heroes. And something like 90% of them were artists. Um, so we already saw the example of English psychologists who discipline themselves in order to create something of value, overcoming their um, uh, desires for comfort and ease. Um, but most of the time, his example is an artist who does exactly that. Um, so it's important that in uh, when Nietzsche is talking about sort of strong individuals who overcome obstacles, Maybe your first thought is of the blonde beast that goes out and acts out its strength on others who are weak. But that's not primarily what Nietzsche is thinking about. Um, his primary case is a strong individual who disciplines himself and is able to overcome his own uh, inclinations to weakness in order to create something uh, of value. OK, and at the very end, section 17, he allows himself just one hopeful note. Um, although it looks as though um, slave morality has won, he says, won't there have to be a still much more terrible, much more thoroughly prepared flaming up of the old fire someday? Still more. Wouldn't precisely this be something to desire with all our might, even to will, even to promote? And this aim must be to achieve a set of values, he says, beyond good and evil. Um, and here, obviously, the good and evil is the contrast the values of morality. Um, so the values beyond good and evil, we can imagine, are life-affirming, that is directed toward the one and only world that there is, and honest, so no imaginary world superior to the one that um, we have. Um, and so it's also not going to be a blind, simple acting out as, <coughs> the, um, as the old noble systems of value were liable to do. So there's going to be a self-disciplining involved here um, and creation of genuine value here in this world. OK, so that's the end of the first essay. The story was of the origin of the moral way of valuing things. Um, it's an account of how moral values emerged in reaction to some pre-moral way of valuing. Um, Nietzsche thinks that what we can understand now more clearly is, um, maybe put it this way, whose interests are being served by 
the moral system of values. Um, and crucially, once we understand what moral values are, and we understand whose interests are served by the moral system of values, and what the likely consequences of affirming those values are, then we'll be in a position to evaluate that, which is what Nietzsche ultimately wants to do. He's already started. So in the second essay, we'll start that on Monday, in the second essay we get a kind of analogous story here. Instead of talking about how the values of morality emerge, we're going to get a story about the origin of the moral understanding of right. A story about the origin of the moral understanding of right actions. So here again, we're going to get a story that traces back um, the idea of duty and obligation to a pre-moral, a non-moral understanding. Um, and here also, we're, we get a more clear account of how it is that the moral of system of evaluation genuinely accomplished something of value. How it made us interested. How it made us something other than blind beasts simply acting out on the basis of our information. Okay, uh, so we'll start that off.